Good evening, everyone, and welcome. This is Nurse Eunice. I'm so excited to see some of my familiar names. So hello, everybody, and welcome. We will get started in about 45 seconds. So let's give a few more people time to join our live stream. Hello, hello, hello. I hope you all have had a great week. If this is your first time joining, my name is Eunice Mathis. I'm a registered nurse and the owner of Florida Training Academy. And what we do is we come on, we gather a few times a week, and we practice some CNA questions. A certified nursing assistant is the aide to the nurse. They spend the most time with the patients. They are the backbone of the healthcare field. Um, there would not be nurses without CNAs. So we work hand in hand together to make sure that we take care of patients. So I thank you all for joining. In. Tonight's um, questions are going to be um, related to infection control and how we keep ourselves and our patients safe. So welcome, welcome. We're going to get started in less than 15 seconds. All right, I see Renee. Hey, Renee. Hey, Paula. Hey, Sandrine. Hey, Kador. Um, I think I had already said earlier, hey to... Um, and so we're going to get started, everybody. So number one, you will use standard precautions in situ situations where you are, A, bathing a resident with a raised red rash, B, cleaning a set of dentures, C, removing used linens from a resident's bed, or D, all of the above. When do you use standard precautions? Yes, yes, I see some answers. Great job, everybody. If you selected D, you are absolutely correct. So any task um, during which you may have contact with open areas of skin, blood or body fluids or mucous membranes, it requires the use of standard precautions, which includes hand washing and the use of personal protective equipment. And as we go through, we'll go um, in depth about the PPE so that you can see the various items that you can use to protect yourself. So great job, everybody. Number two. Patients, are who, patients who are being ruled out for or have tested positive for tuberculosis should be placed on blank precautions. A, airborne, B, protective, C, COVID, D, enhanced. I'm going to read that again. Patients who are being ruled out for or have tested positive for tuberculosis should be placed on what type of precautions? Oh, you all are smart. Yes, yes, yes. Hi, Elena. Yes, everybody. It is a great job. So prior to COVID, we had other illnesses like the flu, tuberculosis. Seems like no one talks about that anymore. But tuberculosis is still present. And it's transmitted in airborne particles called droplets. So when a person coughs, these droplets fall. They're in the air. Um, and usually this person will have a cough, a sneeze. Um, they, are, um, they may also have a fever. So they are highly contagious. And you have to wear a specialized mask called an N95 mask. And if you have them in your facilities, we put these patients in a negative pressure room, which means that whenever you open the door to enter their room, their germs don't go out into the hall. Their air, their germs go out into like a, a different area that's going to be contained. That way the people in the hall don't get tuberculosis. So N95 mask and negative pressure rooms for anybody who has tuberculosis and airborne precautions. Number three, the infection control nurse in your facility informs you that you are due for a TB test. Again, TB is the abbreviation for tuberculosis. You should, A, remind her you had the test last year. B, check to make sure the test is necessary because you have no symptoms. C, check with your doctor um, to be sure the test is necessary. And D, allow the TB test to be given. Hi, Ms. P. What do you think the best response is? All right, so I have a couple of answers there. Let's see if we get a few more. If you chose D as in dog, 
you are correct. We have to get annual TB tests because you can actually have TB and be asymptomatic. So we do annual tests. And if you do test positive, that's when they'll um, follow up with a chest X-ray just to make sure you don't have any um, damage that we're not aware of. So federal and state laws governing infection control in healthcare facilities mandate annual TB testing for employees. Again, TB infection can be asymptomatic and if left untreated, it's going to progress to TB disease and that's when you actually have damaged lungs and we don't want that. Number four, as you are changing the linens on your patient's bed, you accidentally get stuck with a needle that was left in the patient's bed. You must blank. A, report it to the nurse. B, quickly wash your hands with lots of soap and water. C, report the needle stick injury the following day. Or D, both A and B. All right, all right. I think we see a couple of answers coming through. Yes, Elena, yes, Kador. Great job, great job, great job. And here we go, everybody. It is D. Um, exposed needles are considered contaminated. So when you stick yourself with a needle, you must immediately report this to the nurse. Of course, wash your hands with lots of soap and water first. Um, and if you're, if it's during the daytime, the employee health, they're probably going to see you to that department because we may have to get you tested, get that patient tested. And if that patient, you know, does, if we actually know that they have HIV or hepatitis, they can go ahead and put you on prophylactic medication so that hopefully you don't contract it. And so if this is your first time here and you haven't subscribed to our channel, go ahead and do so. That way you'll be notified of our upcoming videos. So you all are winners and I love how you're answering these questions. Great job. Number five, the single most important thing that all healthcare workers can do in order to prevent the spread of infection is, and this is an easy one, A, following standard precautions, B, proper hand washing, C, using gloves, or D, isolating patients. What is the single most important thing that we can do? Oh, great job. Hi, Gigi. Great job, everybody. It is B. So proper hand washing is the single most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of germs. Standard precautions does include the use of gloves when needed in isolation. But as far as we are concerned, if we can wash our hands, we can help prevent some of these germs from spreading. And for those of you all who are taking the CNA exam in Florida, I tell all of my students that if they're going to fail, and we rarely have failures, it's usually because they get nervous and they forget to wash their hands. So if you have an upcoming clinical CNA exam, please don't forget to wash your hands before and after patient care. Hey, Beyonce. All right, number six, the most important part of the hand washing procedure is A, using the hottest water you can tolerate, B, using only antibacterial soap, C, adequate friction, D, taking a full three minutes to wash your hands. Yes, it's good for every state, Miss P. This is just basic um, CNA um, care and concepts. Very good, Life in America. Very good, E. Rios and Kador. So everybody, the answer is... C is in cat, use an adequate friction. And here's the explanation. Rubbing hands together during routine hand washing is the most effective way to remove microbes. Water should be warm, but not uncomfortable hot. Soap does not have to be antibacterial to be effective if proper hand washing is utilized. And then hands, according to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, they should only be washed for a minimum of 15 to 20 seconds. So washing your hands for three minutes was far too long. Very good. Number seven, this one's a little tricky. Which of the following cannot be treated with an antibiotic? A, syphilis, B, gonorrhea, C, shingles, 
D MRSA, M R S A, which stands for Methicillin Resistant Staph Aureus. Which of those cannot be treated with an antibiotic? Good luck in advance, Miss P. All right, looks like I have a few correct answers. It is C, everybody, shingles. And so shingles is not a bacterial infection. Shingles is actually caused by a virus. Therefore, it cannot be treated with antibiotics. The same virus that causes chickenpox is the virus that causes shingles. So your patients will have painful um, sores, blotchy skin, and this is also contagious, just like chickenpox. So this one cannot be treated with an antibiotic. Yes, you would need an antiviral. And Kator, the reason why it's not MRSA is because methicillin resistant, so methicillin in the penicillin family, we can still treat it with antibiotics. We just don't usually treat it with something in the penicillin family. I call it the gorilla cillins. We have to go get the really, really, really toxic antibiotics um, in order to help somebody who has MRSA because they're, they're immune to the other um, antibiotics that we traditionally use. Number eight, everybody, Mr. Delaney has a norovirus infection. Which of the following interventions is not effective against norovirus infections? Which of the following interventions is not effective against norovirus infections? A, hand washing, B, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, C, contact precautions, D, bag and soil linen at the bedside. And I'll give you a hint, whenever there are illnesses on the cruise ships, usually it's caused by norovirus. I'm revealing the answer in three, two, one. It's alcohol-based sanitizer because those spores are hard to kill. The alcohol cannot penetrate it. So we don't use alcohol-based sanitizer on norovirus. And notice I have the image there of someone vomiting because on those cruise ships, when someone has the norovirus, usually it's going to cause vomiting and it's going to cause diarrhea and it is very contagious. And so you have to use soap, water, and friction to remove that virus and contact precautions as indicated. So you Usually when that breakout happens, they just lock any, everybody in their room. Sorry, vacation over. So um, be very careful when you go out on those cruise ships. Number nine, you must wear gloves when you are blank. A, preparing infant formula for a newborn baby. B, transferring breast milk into a baby bottle. C, knocking on a patient's door. Or D, opening a patient's door. When are gloves required? Oh, Gigi, you're going to do great. Good luck in advance. Renee, you're so ready for your test. I'm so proud of you. Anyone else will reveal the answer in three, two, Yes, Nadine. Yes, Elena. Yes, Kador. Breast milk. Out of all of those options, breast milk was the only one that was considered a bodily fluid. So you must wear gloves when you are transferring breast milk into a baby bottle. Um, it's not necessary to wear gloves when you're preparing formula, especially like the powdered formula, or when you're knocking on a door or entering a room. Number 10, what is the purpose of personal protective equipment? or for short, we call it PPE. Is it A, to protect the patient from the spread of diseases? B, to, pro to protect both the healthcare provider and the patient from being infected with diseases? C, to protect the healthcare provider from the spread of diseases? Or D, to protect equipment from being compromised? What is the purpose of PPE? All right, Ivy, I see you, I see you, I see you, Kador. Great job, Life in America. Great job, Gigi. You all got it. It's to protect everybody. So you all are important. We need to take care of ourselves. We don't want to get contaminated. So we're going to wear PPE to protect ourselves plus the patients. Number 11, 
this one's hard. Which of the following is not? And I went ahead and I highlighted not. So for those of you all who have your test coming up, please make sure that you read the questions thoroughly. So I'm going to repeat this. Which of the following is not indicated for maintaining medical asepsis? Whenever you see A, the prefix in front of a word, that means the absence of something. So let's go through. A, thoroughly shaking out linens to remove dust. B, using an overbed table only for clean items. That means you can't put your bedpan on top of a bedside table. Thank you, CNAs. C, holding linen away from your uniform. Or D, cleaning from the least contaminated area to the most contaminated area. So which of these is not indicated? If you're trying to maintain medical asepsis, be as clean as possible. Hi, Levert. All right, I'm revealing the answer in three, two, one. So far, no one's giving me the correct answer, everybody. The one that is not indicated is A. You can do everything else. So if you are shaking out linens to remove dust, your patient who has asthma is probably about to start coughing, and that could be a trigger, which could cause an asthma attack. So we don't shake anything. Shaking linens can potentially scatter contaminated orgasms, plus it can scatter dust. Linens should be gathered and folded inward, keeping the most contaminated area towards the center of the bundle. So everything else, if we go back, everything else would actually help you maintain medical asepsis or being as clean as possible. You never put dirty items on the bedside table. Um, you always keep soiled linens away from your uniform. And for, num for letter D, whenever you're cleansing, think about when you're cleaning somebody, you're giving them a full bed bath. You don't start at their feet first. You start at their face first. You clean from the least contaminated area to the most contaminated area. So A is the correct answer for number 11. Number 12, a systemic, like full blast, total body, a systemic sign of infection is A, swelling, B, redness, C, heat, or D, fever. I just know you all have this one. I know you're going to get this one right. A systemic sign of infection. Yes, 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 everybody. It was D, correct. So signs and symptoms of infection can be local and systemic or body-wide and more diffuse. Some of the systemic signs of infection include a loss of appetite, rapid pulse, fever, and a high blood count. So what you notice as a CNA is this person who is probably having chills. Um, when you take their temperature, their febrile, that should alert you to go get that nurse right away so that we can, you know, call the doctor, order some labs, and that's when we'll find out that they have a white blood count and we'll order blood cultures, etc. So great job. Hi, Millie. Number 13, the nurse tells you Mrs. Kramer's pressure ulcer is not healing because it is covered with a biofilm. A biofilm is best described as A, an easily identifiable pathogen. C, colonies of bacteria with a strong sticky outer coat. C, an airborne pathogen. Or D, a protozoa. I'm going to warn you before we go to the answer that I have an image that may be disturbing. So if you don't like seeing um, infected feet, please close your eyes now. Yes, Renee. Yes, Miss P. You all have the right answer. It is B. It looks like cobwebs. Yuck. <laughs> so a biofilm can infect chronic wounds such as pressure ulcers, and it can be difficult to identify and to treat. So fortunately, I like to say a lot, that's above our pay grade. The doctor, the main doctor is going to go ahead and call in an infectious disease doctor, maybe a wound care doctor, so that we can get some of that 
biofilm removed. And so, um, you know, it's not something you're going to see for a long period of time, but it could be possible that your patient comes in with a severe infection that's covered in sticky biofilm. I know, Nadine. Ew. <laughs> 14, select the correct term and its definition or description. A, medical asepsis, the absence of all microorganisms, including spores. B, medical asepsis, almost sterile. C, surgical asepsis, the absence of all pathogens. Or D, surgical asepsis, which means sterile. <laughs> this one's hard. Life, give me a different answer. This one is hard. So medical asepsis, think about those gloves that are on the wall in your rooms. Um, they're not sterile, but they're as clean as possible for the environment. Yes, Renee. Yes, Miss P. Yes, Elena. Yes, it is D. Surgical asepsis is when it's sterile. So I have the image there of the OR. Remember, you have those scrub techs. They scrub the patient down. The doctor has to put on sterile gloves. We can't use gloves out the box. So surgical asepsis is referred to sterile. Surgical, not medical asepsis, is the absence of all microorganisms, including spores. Like when you're having surgery, they usually start telling you to take baths in this um, um, a chemical agent a few days before so that it's going to be less chance of you getting an infection. So um, surgical asepsis is when everything is sterile. Fifteen. The nursing assistant is selecting the appropriate PPE attire to wear prior to delivering care to a patient who has been placed on contact um, precautions. You'll also hear us say contact isolation. If which of the following items will be worn? Is it A, gloves and a gown for contact precautions? Is it B, gloves, gown, and a face mask? Or C, gloves, gown, face mask, and a face shield? Or D, gloves, gown, a HEPA, or N95 mask, and a face shield. Your patient is on contact precautions. What all do you have to put on? All right, Millie has it. Miss P has it. Kador has it. So you all, this is like the simplest precaution. You're just going to put on gloves and a gown. So contact precautions require the use of gloves and a gown at the very minimum. Droplet transmission requires the use of the medical face mask. And then the airborne, think about the person who has tuberculosis, that's when they're going to put on the particulate um, respirator or the N95 mask in addition to the gloves and, and the gown. So 16. All right, so when you're taking care of these patients, um, it's really important. We talked about hand hygiene, but um, according to a recent study I read, every patient encounters. So if you have 15 patients, every time you enter a patient's room, you're touching a minimum of 15 surfaces. And guess what could be on those surfaces? A, tears. B, feces, C, saliva, and D, emesis. So I'm giving you the answer right there. So which of the following is not a bodily fluid? <laughs> Actually, Elena, A, tears is a bodily fluid. So which of the following is not a bodily fluid? I'm revealing the answer in three, two, and one, Renee, you are correct. It is E, yes, E, none of the above. So all of those were examples of bodily fluids. And I have an image here. So I'm just going to start here at the very top where it says breath. So whatever comes out the lungs, <laughs> bodily fluid. Blood is a bodily fluid. Sweat's a bodily fluid. Saliva is a bodily fluid. Interstitial fluid, whenever someone starts third spacing or their skin starts weeping, that is a bodily fluid. Urine's a bodily fluid. 
seminal fluid, AKA semen, barley fluid, nipple aspirate, the milk that mom produces, barley fluid, tears, stool, and then cerebral spinal fluid. And you're like, I'm a CNA. How am I going to get in contact with cerebral spinal fluid? Because whenever a patient comes in and we're trying to roll out meningitis, those doctors are fast moving. We're going to tell you to go get the um, spinal tap tray. You go to the supply room, you get the spinal tap tray. We hold and we console this patient because this is going to hurt when this doctor is sticking a needle in their back. Your doctors put that needle in, pull it out, of course, get the specimen, put a Band-Aid on it. And guess what they do, everybody? They leave and walk away. So you have all the needles, you have the specimens. I'm still trying to monitor the patient. And so cerebral spinal fluid is, it could possibly be um, very contagious, especially if the person has meningitis. So I need you to treat all fluids that come out of the body as if they're contagious. Number 17, this one's easy. A local sign of infection is which of the following? A, swelling, B, rapid pulse, C, fever, D, high white blood count, a local sign of infection. You got bit by a spider. What do you expect to see? N not, not necessarily, Miss P. A local sign of infection? Yes, yes, yes. Hi, Yvonda. It is going to be A. So that's like the first signs when it's localized. So signs and symptoms of infection can be local and systemic. We talked about systemic before, but signs of local infection include swelling, heat, pain and redness near the area. So it's localized, it hasn't spread yet. We can usually treat this with maybe something topical when you go to the doctor or worst case scenario, they can give you an oral antibiotic. If you wait and it starts becoming systemic, that's when you end up being hospitalized and needing long-term or excuse me, intravenous antibiotics. Number 18, the form of hepatitis for which there is a vaccine available for protection is A, hepatitis A, B, hepatitis B, C, hepatitis C, or D, hepatitis D. So when those jobs are asking you, do you want a vaccine? Do you want to be protected? What type of hepatitis are they trying to protect you from? Hi, Elizabeth. Yes. Great job, everybody. Yes, it is B. They're trying to protect, um, protect you from help B because it is transmitted by all the stuff that's going to be on those surfaces in those patients' room, blood and body fluids. If you contract help B and so like those sinks and faucet handles, ew. That's why we have you use a napkin when you turn the water off, because if the person who used the bathroom before you, let's say they wiped themselves, but then they used their hands to turn the water on. If they had hepatitis B, the fecal matter is on the faucet handles. And now you come in and wash your hands. Bam, you have help B. So please, whenever they're asking you if you want those vaccines, truly consider it because we want to keep you healthy. All right, so help B can cause liver cancer and death. It is a three-part vaccine that has been given for years. Um, of course, I've had my full help B vaccine. And um, so it's recommended for healthcare workers. Number 19, you have cleaned up a broken blood tube, which was dropped in your patient's room while you were performing care. What do you do now? A, let the nurse know so the blood can be redrawn. B, let housekeeping know so that additional floor cleaning can be done. C, nothing further as you have followed procedure and policy in the cleanup. D, both A and B. Life, you can't see me, but I'm over here doing the dance. Ivy and Miss P, I'm doing the dance over here. You all are right. It is D. Hi, Stephanie. It is D. You're going to let that nurse know so that it can be redrawn. But whenever you are cleaning things in the hospital, 
you don't have access to chemicals. Um, we don't use bleach and, and strong items or strong chemicals in a hospital because our patients may be, um, they could be sensitive to that. So you have to notify or the nurse will notify housekeeping. There's still going to be a smear of blood on that floor. You did the best you could. You got up the glass. Housekeeping needs to come and do the rest. So, and then your nurse or phlebotomist will redraw the blood. So please let someone know um, so that we can try to document that incident and hopefully prevent it from happening again because we need to figure out why the last person left a tube of blood in the bed and that was that was not a good thing number 20 which of the following symptoms is not associated with tuberculosis which is not associated a night sweats b hemoptysis whenever you see hemo in front of a term Hemo is the prefix. That means blood. So hemoptysis is coughing up blood. C, weight gain or D, fatigue and weakness, which is not associated with tuberculosis. I said those patients get sick. They have lung disease. They cough a lot. So what do you think is the oddball here? Nadine, I think you're right. Anyone else? Yes, 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 everybody. So because they're so sick, they're having a hard time breathing. They're not going to have an appetite. So what you're not going to expect for somebody who has tuberculosis is weight gain. They usually lose weight, so it's the opposite. So weight loss is associated with tuberculosis, and hemoptysis is spitting up blood, which means they're coughing it up. 21, for which of the following procedures is it not necessary to wear gloves? A, disinfecting a shower chair before bathing a resident. B, assisting an alert and oriented resident to brush his teeth. C, passing meal trays on the unit. Or D, shaving a resident with a disposable razor. That was too easy for you all. That was way too easy. <laughs> Yes, everybody. It is C. You do not need gloves when you are passing out meal trays, but all of the other options um, could have put you at risk of contra um, contact with the blood or bodily fluids. So you need to wear gloves. 22. Which of the following statements describing viruses is true? A, they, be, they can be killed by antibiotics. B, they can cause Lyme disease. C, they can be prevented by some vaccines, or D, they can be seen without a microscope. So it's only one. Which one is true? I see you, Beyonce. I see you, Levert. I see you, Nadine. Great job, everybody. Great job. The answer is, ding, ding, ding. it is C. Viruses can be prevented by some vaccines, which is why we talked about Hep B. Your job is going to offer you a vaccine. Lyme disease is caused by bacteria, and then viruses are very small, and they usually require a microscope to be seen. And so if you're just joining, again, this is Nurse Eunice with Florida Train Academy. Please like the video and subscribe to our channel. And again, we usually post videos about two to three times per week. Number 23, why is mouth care important? A, bed breath is unpleasant to be around. B, bad oral hygiene can lead to malnutrition. C, infected teeth and gums can spread infection to other parts of the body and to the blood causing infections and, a, excuse me, and sepsis. Or D, all of the above. So why must you perform mouth care to your residents? Oh, that was too easy. That was too easy. <laughs> Hi, Kadir. That was way too easy. Great job, everybody. Oh, I should have warned you about those teeth. My apologies. But the answer is D, all of the above. So another way of saying bad breath is halitosis. And that's a very unpleasant scent. Um, I even posted a video a few weeks ago about somebody who had maggots coming out of their mouth because 
you know, the flies, they drop their, their, their larvae, they, their eggs, or maybe they actually contaminated the food and we fed the person. So I need you to perform mouth care, you know, at least once per shift, whether it's an eight or 12 hour shift. But if this person's a mouth breather or if they're comatose, we usually provide oral care more frequently about every two to four hours. Miss P, <laughs> I'm glad I'm desensitizing you now because, yeah, this is what you're about to see in a few weeks once you pass your CNA test. <laughs> Levert. <laughs> Number 24, is there a correct order to follow when putting on PPE? A is yes. B is no. C is yes, but only when my supervisor's looking. <laughs> This one's easy. Is there a correct order to follow when you're putting on your PPE? And yes, life, you are correct. The answer is A, everybody. So I put an image here. And so this image comes from the CDC. So if you want to know the order to put on PPE, and so anytime we're putting on PPE, we call that donning. And that is spelled D-O-N-N-I-N-G. I'm going to put that in the chat. Whenever we're donning PPE, that's when we're putting PPP, PPE on. And when we're doffing, D-O-F-F-I-N-G, I know you all are geniuses, that's when we're taking PPE off. And so the correct order according to the Center for Disease Control is number one, you put your gown on first, you put your mask on second. If you're wearing a face shield or goggles, that would go on third. And the last thing you put on before providing care would be your gloves. Number 25. PPE-related training must cover the following items except when and what kind of PPE is necessary, B, how to properly don, doff, adjust, wear, maintain, and dispose of PPE, C, the limitations of PPE, D, the brand name of PPE. Your job must provide all of the following training except that's right, Miss P. We all have this. That is correct. DD, Ivanda, Gigi, Nadine, you are correct. The answer is D. We don't care about the brand. We just want to make sure that it protects us so that we can protect our patients. And your job is required to train you on the use of PPE if it is needed for your role. For example, if you're a CNA who somehow landed an online work from home job, they're not going to teach you about PPE. <laughs> but if you're on a COVID unit, then they're going to be teaching you some extra steps that you need to take in order to um, keep yourself safe. So you all, you know, I appreciate you and I miss you all. And so this did not come out well, but it said you did good. All right. And look at those clean hands, cleanliness, clean hands next to godliness. All right. So before we exit the line, please let me know where you're from. I know some of you all are returning viewers. I thank you so much. And give me ideals for next week. Someone said they wanted a video on medical calculations, which may may not uh, benefit my CNAs, but is there a video that you all want to see next week? Go ahead and please put it in the chat now before we exit. You're so welcome, Kator. Hey, Nadine from West Palm. And so Cincinnati, you all, we have a few students who are going to be taking their tests soon. So we should have a few more CNAs before the end of the years. So good luck in advance, Gigi from Iowa. We have Paula from Miramar. More videos on safety, please. Can you be more specific? What do you mean by safety? Like um, preventing falls, ethical behavior, KDOR. I'll make sure I put that down. Hi from Houston, Life in America. So either tomorrow, it's probably going to be tomorrow, and I'll take Saturday off, um, but I'll put a, um, our new videos will be listed in the community post, so you'll get an alert. So you all, I have three more ideals. You want more on safety, Sandrine, but I want you all to be more specific. Is it preventing falls? What do you mean by safety? All right, I'm going to go ahead and put fall safety. That is a great one. I will do that. And I'll put in my email address in the chat. And so it's admin at fltraining.com. You all continue to be great. I love you all. And until I see you tomorrow, have a good night, everybody.